Good morning. Welcome to a new day. Let's give God thanks. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's stand and give him our worship this morning. Let's sing together. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. That the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. And be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, amen, amen. Aren't you, aren't you thankful for this day that we can walk in with the goodness of God? What a great day to walk with Him, and uh, what a great day to enjoy. And He made a good one today, didn't He? Yes, he did. Amen, amen. Thanks be to God. Hey, listen to, uh, listen to what the psalmist says. The psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Aren't we thankful that God is the stronghold of our lives? Uh, there are so many uncertainties in this world and so many uh, changing things in, uh, in our journey, in our lives. Thanks be to God. He's our stronghold. Hey, Let's commit our morning to him and trust him to speak to us today. God, you're a great God. You're mighty and good in everything you do. And God, we love you. We love you. Father, you're steadfast in your love. You are, you are boundless in your, uh, in your peace. Uh, you give us grace without measure. You lavish upon us your mercy. God, you are good. We love you. This day as we gather in your presence, Father, we gather with hungry hearts, longing to know your presence, longing to hear your voice, longing to know your will in our hearts and our lives, your direction for our journey. And Father, we just commend these moments to you, praying that the anointing presence and power of your Holy Spirit would rain down upon this place, upon these lives, upon these moments. God, may we behold you. May we know your eminence in worship. God, may we comprehend your voice in word. God, speak to our lives that, God, we might be a people changed. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am so thankful for the work of Jesus in each of our lives. We want to take the name of Jesus wherever we go, and we want to lean on his everlasting arms. Let's sing together. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, Leave. 
trusting arms. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth. invite our children up front for a children's message. So this morning, I have brought with me a fish, not a real one, because they, they're kind of slimy, yeah, and um, a package of crackers because I forgot to grab a loaf of bread, and this is what we have in the church kitchen. We don't keep bread in the church kitchen, but we had some crackers. So I have some crackers and fish, and what if I asked you today, go out and share this and feed everybody in this room with some fish, and we'd pretend it was a real fish, and some crackers. Would you be able to feed everybody in this room? Uh, no, you would not be able to do that, would you? There's at least 10 or 15 people here today. I, there's a lot of people here. And I can, and I can eat like, and, and yeah, and then we've got people up here in the choir loft, and, and, and we even have probably people in the nursery, and I can eat at least half of these crackers right now. So then you're only going to have half the package left, so that's going to be a problem. And so, yeah, that's just not the way it works, is it? Well, let me tell you something. This is a real story. This is a miracle from God um, and how God moves and works and, and, and Jesus is involved. And this is what happens. And you can find this story in all of the Gospels, in all four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and we're going to look at it in Mark today. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're going to look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And this is what happened. Jesus had sent out the disciples, the apostles, whatever you want to call them, those guys that he had started training and teaching them about all the things he wanted them to teach and learn about and showing them that he was doing miracles, 
um, God miracles and healing people and doing wonderful things. And he was teaching them, and they had been taught for a while, and he sent them out and said, go. Go and try to do this. Go and do this, and gave them a few rules and said, go, and then report back. So they went out, and then they came back. And as they came back to talk to Jesus, to report to Jesus the things that they had done, things that they had experienced, Jesus knew that a crowd was going to gather. And so he, before he even knew that, he says, hey, guys, let's go to a, a quiet place. Let's go, and the, the scripture says, um, a desolate place, that place that no one lived, um, that maybe nobody could find them, that they could be kind of in, in a meeting kind of thing, and they could talk about the wonderful things that God was going to do. And so they got in a boat to go to this place, and they, and, and, but there were some people who saw Jesus, and there were some people who saw them leave. And so they started talking, and they started talking, and people started talking, and they said, Jesus is getting ready to do something. I don't know what he's doing, but he's got the, the disciples in the boat, and they're headed, so we better, I think, I think I know where they're going, and so let's go try to find them. And so the people started following, and the people started going, and you know what? They found them. They got to this place where they thought were, no people were going to be, and there began a crowd. The people started gathering. And hundreds of them came, and hundreds of them came, and then thousands of them came. I know. I know. Can you imagine? And they walked, and they walked there, and they started hearing Jesus teaching. They started hearing Jesus teach, and Jesus started teaching all about the wonderful things that God could do in their lives, and they, that God wanted them to, to live a life a right life with him. And so, so they, they, they started listening, and they listened, and they listened. And it started getting late. And, and you know a good preacher preaches a long time, right? Yeah, that's what we've been told. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the Jesus was really teaching, and he was telling them lots of stuff. And they were really listening, and it got late. And the disciples finally, I think they must have nudged Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, it's getting late. And he knew that, too. And so he stopped and he says, yes, let's get them some food. What? Jesus, really? And, and, so, they, and, and so then this, listen to what they said um, um, in verse 27 of Mark 6. It says, but he answered them, you can give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it them to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded all the people to go sit down. And then you know what he did? He blessed the bread and the fish that he found. And we find in one of the Gospels it says that they got it from a little boy. So a little boy gave it. And they took what little was there. And Jesus, after blessing it, started passing it out. And the disciples started giving it to people. And it says that at the end of that, uh, uh, Mark 6, it says they fed 5,000 men. That means they didn't even count the kids and the wives and the daughters and everybody else who came. They just counted the guys, and there were 5,000 of them. So there may have been six or 7,000 or 8,000. Who knows? There were lots of people that got fed that day. And they were amazed that they got fish and bread. And they all had enough to eat. And then the scripture says they collected 12 baskets full of leftovers for another time. Wow, God is so good. And God moved in a little boy's life to give his lunch, whether he gave it willingly or not. I think he probably did. And worked in what seemed to be an impossible thing. And made a possible thing to work. He provided. Because God has compassion on people. He loves us. And wants to provide for us. And that's what Jesus, the, Jesus God's son was saying. I want to provide for them. They, they are like sheep without a shepherd. And I want to give them what they need. So I want them to hear. I want them to have food to eat. I want them to be taken care of. And then what does that mean for us? What do we do? Well, we might be like the little boy. And we might just have to see what, how God can work through us. I don't have anything. God can't do any big and mighty things through me. Oh, yes, he can. He can do wonderful things through you. And you just need to walk with him and listen to him. And it will be amazing what things he will do. He will do wonderful things through you. 
So be willing to let God work through you because he wants to work through his people. He wants to work through his creation. He wants to work through us. He wants to use us so that we can tell others about Jesus. You guys are important to tell people about Jesus. So I want to pray for you. So let's pray together and let's pray for each other, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day and we thank you that you move and work through us. God, you don't have to. God, you could take care of us and never, ever need us. But we thank you that you do. We thank you for your plan so that, that we can be friends and family together and that we can love and care for each other, that we can have compassion and understanding for each other, that we can feed one another, that we can care for one another, we can provide. So, Lord, I pray for our boys and girls that, that maybe think they can't do anything. They can. I pray that you would show them. Maybe it's today by just giving somebody a simple hug or a smile. Or maybe it's just talking to somebody who looks lonely. Whatever it is, Lord, help us to see that so that we can take Jesus to the world. We can take Jesus so that others can hear about this great and mighty work of you, God. Help us to be people that go and tell about you. Help us to love you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys were good listeners. You can get a piece of candy on your way back to your seat. God is mighty. God is wonderful. We want to celebrate what God does for each one of us. So let's stand together and sing, Mighty is Our God. <laughs> mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Ruler of everything. God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything, His name is higher, higher than any other name, His power is greater, for He has created everything. our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything, glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. amazing. You may be seated. Ben's going to come down and share a message and song. Our four-year-olds to first graders are dismissed for children's worship at this time. Never trace nor stain of sin. 
Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace unmeasured love Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful Jesus came for hell-bent sinners? I, I are one. I don't know about you, but he came for me, and uh, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Aren't you thankful the tomb is empty? That there is life to celebrate because of what he's done. Aren't you thankful? Oh, man. What a Savior. What a Savior. Well, hey, let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Here a couple of weeks ago, we began walking through the book of Daniel, uh, trying, to, trying to hear some uh, message for our day and our hour and what God would speak to us out of the book of Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in verse 31. And I, uh, I am astounded at God's providence. I'm astounded at God's care and how God works and how God moves. It's just amazing to me. Uh, we have just lived a week where we have watched the abuse of power among nations. We have watched as the Ukraine has been invaded. We cannot begin to fathom the amount of heartache and sorrow and uh, death and uh, destruction and, and what, is, what is all going to shake out from this journey. And uh, we're in a passage of scripture that says this, that the kingdoms of men are all destined to fail, but the kingdom of God will prevail. And we're going we're gonna to talk about how in the dark moments of life, uh, how does God, uh, what is God doing? And is, is, there, is there purpose? Is there significance? We're going to find in this passage of Scripture unfolded for us the reality and the wonder of God's purpose in the midst of darkness. God's purpose in the midst of darkness. Now, as, uh, as we're coming to chapter 2, we're going to look at this... Uh, this dream, this uh, vision that uh, Neb King Nebuchadnezzar had and how it impacts the end of time and uh, the end days. But just free for nothing, here's just some... I, I want to give you a couple of bullets before we get to our text and then we're going to read our text, okay? But a couple of bullets that are intriguing to me and I couldn't find anywhere to fit them in the sermon, so I'm just going to give them to you. <laughs> Is that fair? But they were just too good, too good. They were just too good. Uh, here in Daniel chapter 2, there are 20 references to God. 
It's all about Him. It's all about Him. And if that's not enough, there are 117 references to what God does in the book of Daniel. 117 times. God. God did. God said. God did. God. God moved. God. 117 times. It's all about Him. This is intriguing to me. Do you realize that there are 34 references or inferrals in the New Testament on Daniel chapter 2? 34 times in the New Testament. These words we talk about today are alluded to in the New Testament. Uh, these are not simply words that were written for somebody in another day. They are words of the revelation of God that speak into our lives. So follow along with me, beginning in verse 31. <clears throat> you saw, O king, and, and uh, remember, let's set this up, I'm sorry, let's set that up. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar has called all the wise men and said, uh, you got to tell me the dream and tell me the vision, uh, tell me that, that, I, that I had and then give me its interpretation or you die. <clears throat> That's his encouragement. You can do that or die. <clears throat> That, that kind of would motivate me. I don't know about you. I would be motivated. And uh, so all the wise men were motivated, but nobody could tell them the dream. And Daniel and his friends didn't know about it. Daniel began to pray, and God revealed. Follow along with me, verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. Its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out, of, out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell you its interpretation, O king. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man, and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold." Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth, and there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divi a divided kingdom, but <clears throat> some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly, from, uh, partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Whew. So let's unpack this incredible dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, what impact it has in, in, uh, in the prophetic voice, what impact it has in our life, and what it says to us today. And I think it says something very, very profound, and I pray that you stay with me so that we can get a hold of the incredible, profound things we can glean out of this text. First of all, let's look at the revelation, the dream that was given to, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. There's a dream given him, and he asks the wise men to interpret it. And uh, man, oh man, uh, moments are tough and things are intense. 
and in this moment we get a glimpse into the reality of the war that we are facing in the spiritual realm because God is moving and Satan is thwarting and Satan is willing to sacrifice all of these false prophets, all of these, all of these necromancers, all of these uh, uh, purveyor of the, purveyors of the stars. He's, he's willing to sacrifice many of his minions so they can get at these four guys that are thwarting his movement in the world. And so in this vision, there is a process by which they are challenged. Now, the dream and the vision come from God. <clears throat> the conflict of death and mayhem come out of the pit of hell. This dream came night after night to Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians often believed that God spoke in dreams. They thought, so therefore Nebuchadnezzar, as he had a recurring dream night after night, could not escape this reality. The hand of God is upon me. The hand of God is haunting me. God is not turning me loose. God won't let me escape. The demands of this are, are, are great, Death will follow unless you tell me the dream and its interpretation. But the good news is God knows what is in the darkness. None of the other wise men knew what was in the darkness, but God knows what is in the darkness and reveals himself to Daniel. Be encouraged, saint of God. God knows what is in your darkness. You will face some moments in your life and you say, what is this? Why did this happen? What is going on? God, are you still on that throne that rules and reigns forever and ever? And yes, he is. Be encouraged, O saint of God. When things get bleak and dark, God knows what is in the darkness. A.W. Tozer said, whatever God can do, faith can do. Whatever faith can do, prayer can do when it is offered in faith. An invitation to prayer is therefore an invitation to omnipotence. For prayer engages the omnip omnipotent God and brings him into the affairs of a human life. God. Nebuchadnezzar sees a dream. It's a haunting dream, the haunting of the Colossus. It has a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Following this great image, there was a rock cut out, not cut by human hands, that struck the image, broke it into pieces. They became like chaff, and they, the wind drove them all, any vestige of their, of their remembrance away. They were all blown away, and that rock became a mighty mountain that filled the earth. That's the vision. So what in the world does that mean? What's the interpretation? Now, it's best to let Scripture interpret Scripture. There are a lot of people that want to talk to you about uh, prophetic moments and prophetic things. And a lot of people will uh, struggle and draw all kinds of charts and everything. Beware of all that stuff. I, you know, guys, uh, if we make uh, broad and bold statements about things that are a little obscure in Scripture, I think we're in trouble. It's best to let Scripture interpret Scripture. What does the Bible say happened here? In verses 37 and 38, Daniel says, You, O king, you are the head of gold. You, O king, you are the head of gold. And then he proceeds to tell him that there are four ensuing kingdoms that will rule the world, and those four ensuing kingdoms that will rule the world will all come to an end. This is a declaration of what is going to happen in the last days. Verse 28, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that God made known to him, known to him what would happen in the latter times. This is, a, this is a, a revelation of what's going to happen in the last days. There is an often recurred statement, latter times, last days, or end times. You will hear that phrase continually in Scripture, and God speaks to us about those things continually in Scripture. The head of gold is Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire ruled the world from 605 to 539 B.C. It is clear that that is what it is because that's what the scripture says it is. This, this marks the beginning of the age of the Gentiles in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. The Bible says they will fall by the edge of the sword, be led captive among all nations. That's exactly what happened. They were led captive to Babylon. They were led, would be led captive among all nations and Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And that's really what we are living in today, the time of the Gentiles, until the coming of the beginning 
of the end, until the end times, which really are the beginning times. And we're going to talk about that here a little bit. The end times really are the beginning times for the saint of God. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a moment. This is a foretelling of the demise of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. I would think it would have been a daunting, uh, a daunting explanation because he was telling Nebuchadnezzar, Hey, I, I've got news for you. Uh, you got a kingdom, but it's going to end. And it was a foretelling of the end of that. And that was, that was uh, confirmed for us in Isaiah 14, verse 4, where he foretells that same thing and talks about when Babylon falls. And he says this, the people rise and declare good is the will of God. The people will rise and say good is the will of God. And that's true, isn't it? Good is the will of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, uh, uh, you're still alive. Okay. All right, the second aspect of this vision is this chest and arms of silver. Most would suggest to you that probably would be the issuance in of the Medo-Persian Empire that ruled the world from 539 to 331 B.C. It was issued in at the Feast of Belshazzar, and we'll look at that in the book of Daniel, and we'll see some of aspects of that in coming weeks. Uh, this Persian Empire would rule the world. The third, uh, the middle uh, uh, and thighs of bronze, uh, some would suggest to us, and I think is accurate, that they would suggest that's the Greek Empire from 331 to 146 B.C. Alexander the Great conquered the, the civilized world. He conquered the whole world in 12 years and sat down and wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. But Greece issued in part of the purpose and plan and kingdom of God. Greece bought, brought a universal trade language to the entire civilized world that would prepare us for the coming of a Savior so that we could hear the gospel. Everybody could hear the gospel across every Every culture, across every, uh, every language, in, in every realm. Greek, brought, Greek brought, brought to us an examination of all human thought. And, and this is what we ended up with all of the great philosophers. Wow, is that all you got? <laughs> is that all you got? That doesn't satisfy my soul. That's not what I'm looking for. That's not filling up the void within my, my, my gut. Is that all you've got? Preparing us for the message of a Savior that satisfies. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> okay, moving on. <laughs> the legs of iron. The legs of iron represent the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire that ruled the entire world from 146 B B.C. to 395 A.D. This kingdom in our text is particularly vicious and powerful. Verse 40, Daniel says it will be strong, it will break, shatter, and crush. And if you read the Aramaic text here in Daniel chapter 2, it's intriguing because there are five phrases that describe different venues, different means, different ways of destruction, of crushing, of, 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 of pain, of suffering, of mess that this empire will bring to the world. It's referenced again in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and verse 23. Verse 7 says, I saw a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong, and had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Verse 23 says it this way, There will be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth, trample it down, and break it to pieces. The feet of iron and clay represent a worldwide power that is yet to come. Now, people have tried to determine what that worldwide power that is yet to come that is issued in the last days is since, uh, since the time of the apostles, since before the time of the apostles. They've been trying to figure out that for ages and ages and ages and ages. Some talk about this uh, power as a great power that has 10 permutations, 10, 10, uh, 10 reflections. Uh, 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 there is some support for that. Uh, this is what I know about that coming kingdom. It's coming. That's what I know. Um, I, can I tell you that uh, there are a lot of people who will tell you, oh, this is where it's coming from. This is where it's coming from. This is what we see. And this is what's happening. And did you read the newspaper? And, and, and can, can I tell you, uh, this is what they know. It's coming. That's what they know. Don't get lost in that. Um, don't get lost in the weeds. Sometimes we get lost in things that are not the real point. What's the real point of this whole text? 
that we understand just exactly what the feet of iron and feet of clay uh, reflect about the ruling and reigning of the worldwide power that is yet to come and how we'll recognize it and how is that the purpose of this 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 vision is that the purpose here let me help you absolutely not absolutely not what's the purpose the purpose is hey there's coming a rock it's going to be cut out not by human hands it's going to roll down it's going to destroy everything in its path and it's going to fill the whole world it's the kingdom of god that's the point that's where we've got to be the rock that comes is the representation of the kingdom of god so don't wrestle with too many prophetic voice things identifying some kind of obscure reference here or there, lest you miss the ultimate truth that God controls history. God's going to accomplish His purpose. Look at these unmistakable truths here uh, that we see. Number one, no earthly kingdom is eternal. They're all going to pass away. No earthly kingdom is eternal. They're all going to pass away. The kingdom we live in, the nation we live in, I've got news for you. If we live long enough, we'll see it end. But not the kingdom of God. No earthly kingdom is eternal. They all pass away. Number two, something is coming that will take all earthly kingdoms out of the picture. You know what? There's going to come a day that none of those things are going to matter because God is going to matter. There's going to come a day where none of that stuff is going to be significant. None of it's going to be center stage in, in history. None of it's going to be center stage in our lives, but the kingdom of God will be. Number three, man's rule on earth will come to an end. Man's rule on earth will come to an end. Number four, the world is big overwhelming it becomes enormous in our lives but God is bigger number five God holds the key to the future not the leaders of men God holds the key to our future not the leaders of men the leaders of men are pawns in the will of God they're pawns in the hands of God Okay, are you still with me so far? I know I'm getting uh, in some stuff that we're not always wrestling with. Are you still with me? Okay. Pretend to look awake every once in a while, okay? It encourages me. So let's talk about the coming kingdom. Let's talk about the coming kingdom. What's the nature of this kingdom? What's the nature of this kingdom that uh, is the kingdom of God? This uh, rock that is going to crush all kingdoms of men and fill the whole earth. What, what is the nature of that kingdom? No, number one, it's a supernatural kingdom. It's supernatural. The kingdom is cut out without hands. This rock comes supernaturally. It wins the day supernaturally. There's no limitation because it is empowered by the living God. It is supernatural. The kingdom grows. It fills the whole earth. There is no place you can flee from the kingdom of God. And the kingdom, it is supernatural. It blows away like chaff. Everything in its, in its road, everything that opposes the kingdom, kingdom of God will just be chaff and will be blown away in a moment at the whim and will of God. It's supernatural. Number two, this coming kingdom comes suddenly. It comes suddenly. Every place you find in Scripture about the kingdom of God and its coming, it comes suddenly. When it is least expected, the kingdom of God arises. It, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible says that it will come like a thief in the night. It will come like a thief in the night. The moment people pay, say peace and safety, it's been like this forever, it's been like this for, for centuries, it's going to continue like this for centuries. <clears throat> Since you're up, God likes making those kinds of things sound like foolishness in our lips. That's about the moment His kingdom will come. It will be a surprising day. It's supernatural, it's surprising. 
Number three, it is a severe day, the coming of this kingdom. Severe day. Every kingdom will be crushed by this great kingdom. Joel, when it talks about the end times, Joel, when the prophet Joel talks about it, he says it is a, the terrible, he references it as the terrible day of the Lord. The terrible day of the Lord. It's a day that many will experience great sorrow. It's a day that the works of men will be evident. It's a day where we will give an account. It's a day where there is no escaping. Matthew chapter 21 verses 42 to 45 says the stone will crush anyone who falls against it. It's a stone that is, is coming and rolling and nothing stops the coming kingdom of God, the severity of this kingdom. It's supernatural. It's, it's surprising. It's severe. God is the Lord and sovereign over this kingdom. Zechariah 14 verse 9 says that he will be the king over all the earth. The Lord is his name. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 teaches us to pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I like what it says in Revelation 11 verse 15. And Re Revelation 11 verse 15 says he will reign forever. He will reign forever. He will be sovereign and this kingdom will be successful. The kingdom will never be destroyed. The kingdoms of men will come and they will go, but not so the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will abide forever. King Nebuchadnezzar spoke of it in this way in verse 47. Your God is God of all gods. He is the Lord of all kings. Your God is the God of all gods. Your, your, your God is the Lord of all kings. He says it this way in verse 44. God's kingdom will stand forever. God's kingdom will stand forever. Verse 45 says, God, Daniel said, this dream is certain. Its interpretation is sure. This is certain. It is sure. It's going to happen. It's going to succeed. And this will be according to the word of God. The kingdom, it will accomplish God's purpose. God's will, God's purpose will never be thwarted. There are times that uh, we look and wonder in this world. Are there not times that we look and wonder and say, God, what are you doing? You ever have, have a moment like that where you think, God, what are you doing? You ever have a, have a moment? <clears throat> you know, I'm dumber than a rock, so sometimes I do dumber than a rock things. Every once in a while I say, God, did you see that? <laughs> That's a stupid question, isn't it? God, God sees everything. God, did you see that? <laughs> Son, I saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But every once in a while, that just wrenches out of my soul. It just springs up within me, God. But this is what I know from this text. That God's will is not going to be thwarted. I see here in this text that the greatness of of the kingdoms of this world are all passing and puny in the eyes of our God. They are passing and puny in the eyes of our God. I uh, watched a little clip of video this week in the Ukraine of a Russian tank wheeling in and an old man who was standing in front of that tank, pushing on the front of that tank. And I, initially I looked at that and I thought, well, that's ridiculous. What's he think he's doing? And I don't know. If the man was a saint of God, God's not limited to deliver by might nor power by many nor few. And one man pushing against the tank with God behind it can stop a tank because God's not limited. He is a mighty God. And what we think is, is powerful and, and overwhelming is passing and puny in the eyes of our God. God's kingdom is coming. And nothing will alter that. And nothing will change that. God's kingdom is coming. That kingdom will be known. That kingdom is sure. 
The dream is sure. The interpretation is sure. That's what Daniel says. You can count on this. Uh, this is going to happen, and it's sure. God's kingdom is sure. Verse 47, God reveals, God governs. When, when the sure and certain coming kingdom of God arrives, it will not just be the end, but it will be for us the beginning. Often we talk about these things as end times, latter times, uh, but you know what? The more I read the Word of God, the more I realize these are beginning times. These are launching times. These are moments where we issue in the, the kingdom of God in all of its splendor, glory, and majesty, and we bask in His presence and experience a new heaven and a new earth. And we'll talk about that another day, but wow! These are beginning times. And that kingdom blesses. Look how this text ends. The king praises Daniel. Now Daniel has gone from looking death in the face to becoming the prime minister of all of Babylon. Can I tell you, if you just walk and live the kingdom of God in your life, God will bless. It may not, you may not understand some of those blessings this side of heaven, but God's going to bless. The king praises Daniel's God. Not only did, did the pursuit of the kingdom of God bless Daniel's life, but it brought glory and honor to God. God, the king praises Daniel's God. The move of God's kingdom brings great glory to God, brings great honor and majesty to our God. It blesses Nebuchadnezzar, promotes Daniel. It blesses Nebuchadnezzar, promotes Daniel's friends. So why are we so engulfed in this world rather than clinging to the kingdom of God? Our text tells us this, the kingdom of God is coming. Let us cling to the kingdom. In eight, 1987, there was a com commuter flight from Portland, Maine to Boston. The pilot's name was Henry Dempsey. He heard an unusual noise in the rear of the plane, and so he surrendered uh, control of that jet to the co-pilot and went back to check it out. As he reached the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket, and Dempsey was tossed against the rear door. He soon discovered what that original noise was. It was caused by the rear door that had been improperly latched prior to takeoff and the impact of his weight against it forced it open and he was sucked out of that tiny jet instantaneously. The co-pilot saw the red light which indicated an open door. He immediately radioed the nearest airport requesting permission for an emergency landing. He reported the pilot had fallen out of the plane and wanted a helicopter to search the area. After the plane landed, the ground crew found Dempsey holding on to the outdoor ladder of the aircraft. Somehow he had caught hold of the ladder and held on for 10 minutes while the plane flew at 200 miles an hour at an altitude of 4,000 feet. And when it landed, he somehow kept his head off the runway, although there was only 12 inches of clearance. And according to news reports, it took an air airport personnel several minutes to pry Dempsey's fingers off that ladder. So what are you holding on to? Are we clinging to the kingdoms of this world? Are we clinging to the affairs of men? Or are we clinging to the kingdom of God? What are you holding on to? Our musician's going to come. We're going to sing our hymn of decision. It is a miracle of grace. It's a miracle of God when he speaks to our lives. Perhaps today, perhaps today, the king has spoken to you. He's spoken to you of your need of a savior. You know what? Apart from Christ, we're without hope. We're without hope. There's nothing we can bring. I don't care how good you are. You can't be good enough. I, I don't care what ritual you do. I don't care what, what, what prayer you pray. There's nothing we can do to purchase our salvation. It is entirely grace, it is entirely God. But the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart. Grace is prompting. 
If so, I would love to visit with you. I'd love to pray with you. Our youth pastor would be here. We'd love to pray with you today should the Spirit of God speak. Perhaps today, maybe, maybe God's spoken to you about community, your need for, for local, local community, being part of a body of believers. We would welcome you to our faith family here. Uh, that begins, that process begins by making your way forward, expressing that desire that we might welcome you to our family. Perhaps today, God just put something on your heart you want to take to the Father. The altar's open, you want to come and pray. You want someone to pray with you? We're here. We would delight to pray with you. So as we stand, as we sing, and as God speaks, let me invite you to respond to him today. Have I no